Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, pour out on us the abundant gifts of your Holy Spirit. May the work begun by the Spirit on the day of the Pentecost continue in us as we hear your word and do your will. Amen. Our first reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 22 through 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with it. We wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This ends the first reading of the, or the reading of the first scripture, the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was talking with one of my kids on the phone this week, and she asked me, what's your sermon about? And I said, well, it's Pentecost, so I'm preaching on you know, that chapter from Acts where the Holy Spirit descends on all the apostles in Jerusalem and then they start speaking in tongues. She goes, oh, I'm not really familiar with that passage. I said, sure you are. 
I said, it's the passage we read every Pentecost. You know, the one where the violent wind blows and, and the tongues of fire land on their head. Nope, she says. Doesn't ring a bell. I said, are you sure you don't know this one? I mean, you've been to church on Pentecost since you were born. It's a pretty common story. Can't say I know it, Mom. Well, I can say this is a little concerning to me. Not just not, not because my kid couldn't remember a common Bible passage. I, I don't get too concerned about those things. But I was concerned because Acts 2 is the origin story of the church. And this child who spent every week in the pews with us and who attended Sunday school and who attended a midweek Bible program and who attended vacation Bible school every summer and who in two weeks is going to go off to church camp, this child did not know the origin story of the church. And, you know, I can't blame her Sunday school teachers because I was her Sunday school teacher. <laughs> But you know, she's not the only one who doesn't remember this story. For a lot of us, this story doesn't stand out in the same way that the Christmas story stands out or the Easter story stands out. And yet it's one of the three holy days of the year. And this fact, I believe, reflects a lot about where the church ranks in our understanding of our faith life. I think in the grand story of God, the church is a bit of a diminished character, even among us churchgoers. I mean, the Christmas story is about the birth of Jesus. And the Easter story is about the resurrection of Jesus. And these stories are deeply embedded in our consciousness because everyone loves Jesus. Jesus is, is really cool. He's got all the great comeback lines in the Bible. He cares about the underdog. He heals people. He loves people. We love Jesus. The church, not so much. The church hasn't always loved people or healed people people or cared about the underdog. Throughout history, the church has made serious mistakes, and it continues to make mistakes. Rarely as Christians do we ever feel the need to apologize for Jesus, but sometimes we feel the need to apologize for the church. So this story about the origin of the church takes a back seat in our tradition. We don't laud it the way we do the other stories. But I have to tell you, this is an amazing story. It tells us about the past, yes, but that isn't its real purpose. Its real purpose is to illuminate who we are today. So I want to take just a moment and remember the whole story. So Jesus' closest followers, the one who sat around the table with him during the Last Supper, the ones who abandoned him as he was taken into custody by the Roman soldiers, those broken and flawed human beings were in a bad state after Jesus died. They had lost their friend and their leader. And in the darkest hours that led to his death, each one of them witnessed, beyond a shadow of a doubt, their own shortcomings as his followers. They experienced both grief at his loss and shame at their own behavior. But then they witnessed the resurrection of Jesus as he rose from the dead. And in the resurrection, they found forgiveness and the grace of God, which wiped away their shame and their grief. And that was not the end of it. Jesus appears to them multiple times, as recorded by the Gospels, after the resurrection. In Mark, he appears to them at supper. And in Luke, he comes to them through the locked door of the room where they're hiding out. And then later, he appears to them on the road 
to Emmaus. And in Matthew, he appears on the mountaintop and he gives them the Great Commission. And in John, my favorite, he appears on the shores of the Sea of Tiberias and he cooks them breakfast. And Jesus, in each of these appearances, gives the disciples directions about what the next steps are going to be. And the next steps are clearly what we call today the church. And during Jesus' last appearances to the disciples, he tells them that they're about to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And by the way, this is what John had said about Jesus way back in the beginning. But they don't know what that means. And so they ask Jesus to be a little bit more specific about what's going on. But of course, Jesus, as usual, ignores their pleas for details and just tells them to wait. And then Jesus is taken up into the sky in a cloud. And this time, he's really gone. And so they're all standing there. And they're, they're looking up at the sky, watching as Jesus just ascends up there. And as they look down, there's these men in white robes. And we've seen this before. This happened at the, at the tomb. And they said, don't worry. Jesus is going to come back down in the same way. And so these disciples are left alone. So what do they do? Well, they go to Jerusalem, like Jesus tells them, and they wait. And they don't know what they're waiting for, but they're willing to wait. And along with the apostles, there are some women leaders there, and there are a lot of other followers. They, the, the scripture says about 120. So what do you do when you're waiting around for God to tell you what to do next? Well, they get busy starting to form a community. And that is just what they did. They, first, they figured out, okay, well, there were originally 12 of us. And, you know, there were 12 tribes of Israel, so that's a really good number. And, but now we're only 11 because, you know, Judas, you know, Judas. Um, and so we better find a replacement. And so they have two candidates that are good potential replacements, uh, a man named Justice and a man named Matthias. Ma Matthias. And so they pray and they say, God, we know that you know who this is supposed to be. And so they cast lots, which is kind of like rolling dice, and Matthias wins. And he becomes the 12th apostle. And then we never hear his name again, which just goes to prove that there's no glory in church committees. <laughs> so all this time, they're waiting for what's going to come next. And they're just staying together, keeping busy coming up with things to do. And these broken, fallible human beings, men and women, rich and poor, slave and free, educated and uneducated, they're just together. They're learning how to be a community. In fact, most of the rest of the New Testament is about learning how to be a community. But then Pentecost comes. And they're all gathered together somewhere out in the streets in one place. And the spirit is unleashed, just like Jesus promised. And it's crazy. I mean, this is one of the most turbulent events you can imagine. Violent winds blowing flares, uh, flames flying out, deafening sounds filling the air. And the spirit disrupts their calm retreat, their attempts to make a community with wind and with fire. And they start speaking in different languages. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us exactly what they say, but it does tell us that people heard about God's mighty deeds. They heard it in their own language, and they understood. And whatever it is that the disciples were given to speak had an effect. It got people's attention. So this one group of Galileans who are gathered together expand their reach and bring in an incredible diversity of people. The list is long. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, it goes on and on. There's also Jews and there are Gentiles. There are male and female, slave and free. And this is the origin story of the church. It is a mixture of togetherness and diversity. 
It's a balance between being in one place and going out to all the world. It involves both tedious and mundane housekeeping chores and turbulent life-altering events. The church is made up of regular people who can be counted on to mess things up on a regular basis, partnered with God's Holy Spirit, who flares out sporadically, unexpectedly, with energy and power. This is the story of the church today. This is the story of this church. This church is held together in hard times by the bonds of long-term, multi-generational relationships. It is also dependent upon the energy that newcomers like myself bring. It's a place where people care for one another. It's also a place where people are made ready to go out and care for strangers. It's an organization with a leadership structure governed by rules and shared agreements, but it's also a chaotic, disorganized mess where we all do the best we can and often fall short of the ideal. What the spirit, spirit brings is a chaotic life force that mixes our human connections with the divine. It disrupts our attempts to bring order and makes perfect use of our imperfections. If you look at the church through the lens of reason, it's a messy, stuffy, flawed institution. If you look at the church through the lens of faith, it is the shaky hands and wounded feet of Jesus in the world. So today is our first in-person worship. This is a big day. It's Pentecost. And if we were a perfect church, I was thinking to myself, okay, if I was a really organized pastor and had my act together, we would have had this place all decorated. And I was going to bed last night thinking, ah, well, okay, we just do the best we can, right? It was enough to get ushers here. And I was thinking, you know, if I was a really organized pastor, I would have been in my study most of the week, pouring through commentaries, trying to understand the scriptures at a deep theological level so I could deliver to you a meaningful sermon. But the truth was, if you came and found me this week, you probably would have seen me running around trying to find the shutoff valve for the water after the flood in the preschool room. And yet this morning I come, and there's red streamers out on the, on the tree out there. I had no idea it was going to be there. The spirit acts. And you know, if I, as I sat down to write my sermon, I realized that the messiness of this week was God's commentary on this scripture. The Spirit speaks in words that we can understand. And so here we are, despite all our imperfections and our messiness, gathered in one place, here and online, and the Spirit has come. And our lives are being shaped and transformed, and the words are being spoken in a language people can understand. And while some may be standing back thinking, why are they so happy? Are they drunk? We can trust that this is who God has called us to be. This is the origin story of the church. It's not a story about perfect people. It's a messy story about human beings following Jesus to the best of their ability, partnered with the Spirit, making mistakes, and yet persisting year after year, generation after generation, century after century. 
So let's not forget this story. It may not be as dazzling as a choir of angels directing the shepherd to, to a manger to see the baby Jesus. And it may not be as dramatic as the disciples running to the empty tomb. But it is a story about Jesus. It is a story about Jesus born in us, the body of Christ. A community gathered here in the world. A single light of salvation for all of creation. Amen.